uh, not dealing with chest x-rays which have been dealt already. So let's start with the abdomen radiograph. We all know that uh, uh, common indications are uh, uh, intestinal obstruction, suspecting bowel ob obstruction or perforation. And the views commonly, uh, if you suspect an intestinal obstruction, definitely these two views should be taken. A supine AP view of the abdomen and an erect AP view if the subject is able to stand to detect the fluid level. If the subject is very uh, ill, cannot stand for, a, uh, for uh, the X-ray projection, a supine AP and you should definitely include a chest radiograph too. So I would like to have a, a good response from the audience. I, I am not sure whether there are um, postgraduates here, maybe uh, practicing, radi uh, practicing doctors. So you can uh, respond to the uh, radiograph. So uh, I have given the diagnosis already. This is small bubble obstruction. So the first image showing multiple air fluid levels, dilated bowel loop, multiple air fluid levels. And the uh, next one also showing multiple air fluid levels. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, suggesting small bowel obstruction. So can uh, anybody describe like how you can be sure that it is small bowel? Okay. So, so you can see a uh, dilated bowel loop with multiple air fluid levels here also. These are uh, radiographs of two different patients. They came with abdominal pain and distension and clinically suspected intestinal obstruction. So can anybody just say how you are very sure that it is a small bowel and not a large bowel. So our conventional teaching us small bowel loop will be centrally placed centrally placed. Most of them are centrally placed. Um, any audio problem? Okay. So, uh, and there are multiple air fluid levels also. So, small bowel loops when dilated are usually uh, centrally located. And you see here, this is also small bowel, but not very much centered. Uh, you can see that this is more peripherally. You may confuse it with a large bowel. So how can you differentiate, well, uh, be sure that it is small bowel uh, and not a large bowel. You may think this is a transverse column which is peripherally located. So how to be sure? Look for the mucosal folds. Yes. Please be loud. Please respond. Uh, this is the mucosal folds. You can see that they are seen through and through. The mucosal folds are seen through and through which is the valvulae conventus of the jejunum, which, which is diagnostic of a jejunal loop. So we are sure that it is a jejunal loop and it is a small bowel obstruction, though it is peripherally placed. So the classical teaching us small bowel loops are centrally placed, but in a very much dilated uh, small bowel loop, you can see it in the periphery like this which may confuse, the, uh, confuse you whether it is a large bowel, but then look for the uh, mucosal fold. When you see it through and through the valvulae conventus, you can be sure that it is small bowel. So here also two radiographs showing small bowel obstruction, but there is clue here and also there is a clue here. So can anybody uh, identify the clue? Here, this is a pediatric radiograph. Anybody got that? See the bowel loops are. Uh, this is a supine AP view. Supine, that is the radiograph taken on the subject lying down. So you are not seeing the air fluid levels. Uh, there are multiple bowel loops dilated. You come down, and what is this? Yes, yes, you got it. What is it? That is the clue. What is it? A bowel loop is seen well below the pelvis at the inguinal region. So it is a yes, inguinal hernia, inguinal hernia. So that is the cause for the bowel obstruction here. So an inguinal hernia causing bowel obstruction. You are not seeing the air fluid level because it is an AP view, not an erect view. Only in an uh, erect uh, AP view you will get air fluid level. So you can get clue from the radiograph. That is the uh, radiograph, this one showing. What is the clue here? 
it's very subtle uh, uh, i'm not sure whether you can see there are some surgical stapler shadows here hope you saw it okay so these shadows that means there is a history of surgery and probably these you, here you can see the air fluid level dilated bowel loop small bowel obstruction so uh, this may be a post adhesive small bowel obstruction this uh, subject had undergone um, uh, uh, low anterior resection for ca rectum then there was eostomy also then the eostomy closure was done and later presented with abdominal distension and pain suggest uh, and the uh, radiograph suggested uh, bowel obstruction ct was done later to confirm and again you need even though we get clues like this we want to know about the uh, to confirm it by ct and also to know the uh, other ancillary findings we need uh, to go for contrast ct scan so here it is uh, labeled as large bowel obstruction this is the large bowel so again how to differentiate as i have told you before the mucosal fold are you seeing the mucosal fold what is the difference yes they are incomplete they are not through and through not passing through and through that is the ostra hostel fold of the colon and the colon is uh, dilated till this level left upper quadrant here there is a cut off that arrow is pointing to the level of obstruction here uh, this is an adult with a uh, uh, constipation and uh, abdominal pain distension so here there was a mass lesion which is involving the uh, transverse colon mid third of transverse colon mass lesion carcinoma was diagnosed uh, later in the ct scan so this an uh, intussusception like appearance can be seen in adult uh, radiograph uh, where large bubble obstruction happens so next is also large bubble obstruction so any clue of the cause for large bubble obstruction here yes good that is valvular so can anybody tell which valvular yes correct that is the sigmoid valvular what is the sign coffee bean sign this is the bird beak sign so sigmoid valvular often seen in the elderly people and uh, the the uh, the twisted bowel valvular means there will be a twist along the mesentery twisted bowel occupies the the twisted sigmoid colon occupies the right upper quadrant usually and this may be the only bowel loop which we may see so this was two cases and this are, uh, are also valvular cases what do you think this is this one that's also valvular which valvular this is so these two are seen with the apex in the uh, left upper quadrant so this is sigmoid valvulus again but this is cecal valvulus so it, it, the classical teaching is cecal valvulus will uh, be usually towards the left upper quadrant cecal valvulus will be towards the left upper or the midline or towards the uh, pelvis which crossing the midline but here uh, like here you are seeing it the left upper quadrant so definitely this is cecal valvulus and you are seeing some bowel loops above that they are the transverse colonic loop transverse colonic loops are seen above and uh, dilated loop towards the left upper quadrant this is cecal valvulus that is definite but here uh, the classical teaching is sigmoid will be towards the right upper quadrant but here you are seeing it towards the left and uh, a clue uh, here is that you are not seeing any other bowel loop uh, upper like superior to that dilated loop here you are seeing some loop above that here there is no loop only some loops are seen here so that is a northern exposure sign no exposure sign that means there are no uh, no bowel loops there that is also suggesting a sigmoid valvulus so again valvulus can commonly affect sigmoid and the cecum and they can cause large bowel obstruction and the clues you can and you can definitely diagnose by radiograph there are many signs as we have seen these are also some bowel loops which you may feel it as abnormal they are floating bowel loops due to ascites good that is due to the ascites very gross ascites was there this is a compressed bowel loop only one bowel loop is seen in the midline and a few smaller ones here and both sides it is very much opaque as if something is occupying 
what can it be that is an enlarged liver an enlarged spleen uh, there was a, a large hepatosplenomegaly here uh, when a CT scan was done and that was compressing. So, so the abnormal bowel loop need not be obstruction always. There can be other causes like this. Here is something which is very, uh, very common and uh, familiar to you. Air under the diaphragm suggesting pneumoperitoneum. This is a large pneumoperitoneum with air fluid level. So let's see this case. This is a pneumoperitoneum, some features. So when you are suspecting pneumoperitoneum and you are asking for a chest x-ray, erect, you should ask for a chest x-ray, erect view, abdominal x-ray, erect if possible. And uh, I make uh, the subject sit for about 10 minutes so that gas will rise to the top of the peritoneal cavity and it is seen outlined. And uh, abdominal x-ray may be challenging. There are many signs. We will see these signs, cupola sign, wrigglers, loose and liver, football sign. So we will see, just have a look at the sign. What is this one? <coughs> Any sign? This is the subdiaphragmatic air. This is also in the air outlining the liver. That is the, this all suggests a pneumoperitoneum. What is this sign called as? That is the cupola sign. Cupola sign that is along the tendril tendon of the diaphragm. What is this sign? Yes, common. Air is seen on both sides of the bowel uh, wall. So that wall is seen clearly. That is the regular sign. And this is the common air under the diaphragm. These are some signs. Again, these signs are formed due to uh, the air outlining the ligaments, the, nor the normal ligaments in the abdomen. That's how these signs are formed along the falciform ligament, along the lateral umbilical ligament, triangular collection of gas in Morrison. That is dog cat sign. Dog sign is what you have seen here. This one. Telltale triangle sign, then uracle sign along the outline in the middle umbilical ligament. These are some of the signs for the interest of PGs, entrance questions. Then this is a case where an elderly female uh, underwent a procedure, endoscopic procedure, dilatation of the esophageal stricture. There was a tight stricture in the distal esophagus, so gastroenterologist. Uh, try to dilate it, uh, like dilatation was complete and post procedure an x-ray was taken. Uh, she complained of slight pain and uh, post procedure x-ray was this. Immediately the gastroenterologist called to our department to report this x-ray. Uh, they feel that there is pneumoperitoneum. So what do you think? Uh, is there? Yes, there is perforation. So they suspected perforation. Because it was a uh, difficult procedure, the, it was a tight stricture, so they had to go for some uh, depth and for, uh, the procedure also took longer time. We also suspected a perforation and pneumoperitoneum. There, was, there is gas uh, uh, outlining the, under the diaphragm, both sides. Uh, is there any doubt? Uh, anybody having any doubt? Yes, there can, it can be chilarity. So, because we are seeing uh, folds also, mucosal folds also, we had a, a second thought whether this is a, just a dilated loop, okay? And this is also a dilated stomach. So, we uh, asked, we also told, uh, we not 100% sure, we have to go for CT scan. CT scan was done and it was not a perforation, uh, it was a dilated bowel. The bowel was seen anterior to the right lobe of liver, chilarity syndrome like appearance. There was no prior CTs done. And uh, the, the stricture esophagus was also an endoscopic diagnosis. So she didn't went for, she didn't underwent any uh, axial imaging before. So that was a new finding. And this was a slight dilated stomach uh, post procedure. So post procedure, post endoscopy uh, air, uh, 
some little amount of air is normal. There can be like, dilatation of the stomach also that can be normal. So be careful on reporting and always uh, you can ask for next imaging. And conventionally it's not the, uh, uh, not the uh, final uh, modality, you can go for the next modality. So that is called as pseudo-pneumoperitoneum. These are the causes. Basal linear atelectasis, pneumomediastinum, chilidity, gas within skin folds, subdiaphragmatic lipomatosis, properitoneal fat strike, diaphragmatic undulations. <coughs> so, this is also a case of pseudo pseudonumoperitoneum. Can you describe the findings, anybody? Chest radiograph. You can see many gas loosened, air loosened in the subcutaneous planes. This is surgical emphysema and there is, yes, there is pneumomediastinum. You can see the uh, air outlining the right, uh, right heart border, also along the left heart border and slightly outlining the diaphragm, making a, a partly continuous diaphragm sign and this can be mistaken for a pneumoperitoneum. That is why that one of the causes for pseudo-pneumoperitoneum is pneumomediastina. Uh, a, a case where there is severe surgical emphysema, pneumomediastina, even pneumopericardium can be there in some cases, which can mimic pseudo-pneumoperitoneum. So, have, you have to be aware of all these conditions. So, talking about abnormal air, this is another abnormal air that is already marked, pneumobilia. You, can you identify here? Uh, so, how can you, is there any other possibility for this air? What else can it be? That I will show you in the next slide, but just to remind. Yes? Yes? Gallbladder, emphysematous GB, uh, cholecystitis, gallbladder perforation, and another one close to that. All these are correct. Very good. Next. One more common, very um, um, sick patient, morbidly ill, signs of necrotizing infection in the colon, intestine, endocolitis, portal venous gas. Okay, that also can mimic this. So, how to differentiate? You can see the gas uh, air lucency here in the right upper quadrant in the region of liver, that is pneumobilia. Whereas this is also air lucencies, branching air lucencies in the right upper quadrant, that is portal venous gas. So how to differentiate? Portal venous gas will be seen more peripherally, branching pattern more peripherally, whereas pneumobilia more towards the center because the bile flow will push the air towards the hilum of the liver. So you will see it more centrally, pneumobilia, whereas portal venous gas will be more out, uh, outer okay and branching pattern of course you are you are speaking from the image point only there will be a patient in front of you so you always can have a clinical and you will have a clinical diagnosis in your mind correlating with that you will definitely get the uh, answer so as somebody uh, told they, this is an emphysematous cholecystitis and gp perforation which will be seen in the right upper quadrant. This is slightly towards the midline and towards left side because uh, there was a difficulty in positioning the patient, a very sick patient. That was, was what written in this one. This is a image uh, is taken from the net. What is this? So we have come to the uh, uh, radio opacities. Now we are leaving the air lucencies and coming to the radio opacities which we come across. What is this? What can it be in the right upper quadrant in the region of liver? Yes? Gallbladder calculus. Cholelithiasis. Or if you are searching for foreign bodies also, like you have, you will be see, you are searching for Sometimes abdominal radiographs may be asked in pediatric patients especially or in adults to search for foreign bodies. In such cases, you will come across such uh, radio opacities also. So based on the locations, you can identify, you can diagnose where it is. This is the pancreatic acidification, which is seen in an obliquely placed manner along the midline and towards the left side. 
very uh, coarse and the calcification. So, can you identify something here? I have marked already. There are multiple dilated bowel loop and it is a closer view. See, an umbrella like thing that is the IVC feature. Which is now because of the advanced interventional procedures, uh, IVC filter is placed in subjects who are diagnosed with deep venous thrombosis to prevent the thrombus from migrating to the heart, migrating to the pulmonary circulation. Uh, IVC filters are kept just above the, uh, just at the, like just at the renal site, it is placed in the IVC. Okay, so that is the IVC filter. Because you may come across such more uh, in innovative uh, opacities in the in the in the practice nowadays. More and more intervention procedures are coming up. Can you identify something here? This is a post-surgical case. A chest with the upper abdomen is seen. You are seeing an abnormal opacity here. What should you suspect? And, and adjacent to that, there are some linear uh, lucent-like uh, opacities also. And there is a crumpled thread-like opacity. Post-surgical patient. Yes? Yes? Do you suspect foreign body? Foreign body. Post-surgical patient, foreign body. This is the, actually this is the marker for the surgical gauze. Okay, radiopaque marker is now kept in the surgical gauze to identify. Suppose there are surgical mob counts now. We know that, we, we know that the surgeons do the counts before and after the surgery. And suppose they miss, they expose, uh, radiograph exposure also done. And this, there can be, like, they can um, identify. But this case, this is not a forgotten mob, but this was a pack, this is a polytrauma case. So there was severe liver laceration, renal laceration, uh, gross pneumo, uh, hemoperitoneum. So open, um, uh, like, um, uh, the laparotomy was done. Uh, packs were kept and uh, post-surgery uh, radiograph. After the hemodynamic um, condition of the patient stabilized, opened again, the packs were removed. Many weeks later, two, three, after two weeks, I think, the packs removed. Then the, there was renal uh, vascular injuries. All those interventions were done and the patient was discharged also. So this was removed later. So the, that is just to uh, make you aware that such crumbled or linear thread-like structures can be the radiopaque markers of the surgical. Suppose somebody tells that there is a suspicion of a foreign body with recurrent abdominal history and uh, abdominal pain and all, this should be kept in mind. Is the gas under the diaphragm? That's a test tube. Uh, test tube is there, there is pneumothorax, there is no gas under the diaphragm. And in this like there is no um, pneumo, pneumo is not there. Like because it's a post surgical case, you expect a little gas also, but there is no gas here. So this is a so triangular. Pardon? Yes, the can be seen after surgery. Can be seen, sir. Even uh, after the endoscopy procedure, also there can be minimal gas. And if it is asymptomatic, it is normal. Nothing to be worried of. And uh, these are triangular areas of radio opacity in the region of supra renal, just above the level of kidneys. Adrenal calcification, classic adrenal calcification can be congenital, can be acquired. Adrenal hematomas, chronic hematomas can calcify and cause opacities like this. So, this is again uh, abdominal radiograph taken for some other purpose, and you are seeing a calcified opacity here. What is it? Again, it is marked calcified fibroid lobulated and coarse calcification, round shape, often in elderly, you can come across this calcified fibroids. Next, after the radiograph of abdomen, you are coming to the KUB radiograph, which is commonly requested. And what is the difference between an abdominal radiograph and a KUB is, KUB only you need to cover the kidney and urinary bladder, which should include the 
pelvis, the region of posterior urethra. Because there can be calculus in the posterior urethra also. So definitely you should include the pelvic region, but need not include the uh, upper abdomen or the uh, area under the diaphragm is not included. But in an abdomen radiograph, area under the diaphragm should be should be included. That is one major difference and our area of interest is the KUB. Here it is a very common one. What is this? DJ stent. There is a calculus in the upper urethra. At the level you can say there is a ca small calculus in the right kidney also. What is this? It is marked here. There are multiple air lucencies in the region of right kidney which suggests emphysematous pyelonephritis in proper clinical setting in diabetic chronically ill patients with uh, urinary infection and very sick condition you have to suspect and you you nowadays you don't go for an x-ray initially you usually go for ultrasound and that can detect and uh, this was a case uh, x-ray showing radiograph showing a emphysematous pyelonephritis similar to the uh, emphysematous cholecystitis which was more rounded and more towards the right side upper part. <coughs> Similarly, you can get abnormal gas shadows in the region of urinary bladder case of emphysematous cystitis. So these suspicions you should have in the proper clinical setting. Let us come to some MSK radiograph. <coughs> The usual MSK uh, in our practice, in your practice will be LS spine, AP, lateral views. So uh, uh, normally you have to look for the vertebral alignment, the, uh, the vertebral body height. Uh, you can uh, see that uh, these eye-like these structures are the pedicles of the vertebrae. Look for the intactness of the pedicles and in this case you are seeing what is this? It is marked that is the spina bifida. There can be an incidental finding or patient may have a, a back pain, complaining of back pain and there can be spina bifida occulta with a, a, a lumbarization, sacralization which may be the cause of chronic back pain due to the underlying disc problem. This is a lateral uh, spine radiograph where the finding is very subtle that is why I have written as spondylolysis marked. I think you can identify this one. There is a defect in the interarticular uh, uh, face joint uh, widening is there. You can see that is the lysis and there is a little uh, very minor lysis. So uh, next case I will show you the true case, like very uh, evident case of lysis. This you will definitely identify that there is a anterior lysis of the L4 over L5 and the defect here pars interarticularis defect. This is a classical spondylolysis with spondylolysis. You should not miss this. In such cases, here this is a very uh, minor spondylolysis. So you may not see this and so this defect also you may just uh, ignore. Okay, so look for such defect in cases where there are like chronic back pain and x-rays are taken. Uh, in the lateral view, look for the alignment uh, like just see the how, uh, just imaginary line through the anterior cortex of the vertebrae you just draw and also through the posterior uh, posterior uh, cortical line like this. So in this case that line is broken because it is listed, there is a listed. So that is all you have to access and then go for the vertebral body height, the intervertebral height and that is how you can uh, infer a disc or a vertebral problem and further MRI or further investigations can be done. So see this case, anything you, you can see, see, uh, like uh, uh, the upper part lumbosacral region looks normal, you will say that like for a minor spondylotic, other than the minor spondylotic changes you may not uh, detect any other abnormality, come down, see there is the last, the caudal most coccygeal segment is a little displaced, angulated, so there is a uh, subluxation here. Here also there is an angulation. So these are the areas which can be missed just to make you aware. This patient ha was com had a trauma, trivial uh, trauma like slip and fall and was complaining of pain in the uh, lowermost uh, part, the coccygeal region. This, this is, what is this one? You are seeing anterior to the vertebra? 
Yes, calcified iota, atherosclerotic iota. Good. So, next one. Okay, so now coming to the cervical spine x-ray. I have already marked, can you identify the uh, finding? See, there is a diffuse uh, hyper, the, uh, uh, what to say, a fused appearance of the vertebra. Anteriorly, there is ossification, that is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperosmosis. This patient complained of stiffness and restricted movements of the neck. So, uh, that's how these patients present and look for such abnormal ossifications. This often can be confused with OPLL. See here, there is a uh, high, uh, sclerotic line here, C23 level, that is the ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. Often these may, you may see in the uh, common practice, this is OPLL. So, <coughs> diagnose this, definitely there is a fracture and uh, dislocation or subluxation. What is this fracture called as? What is the um, uh, the, the remarkable uh, point you are seeing in the word spine is? Spine is fused. See, all the spines are fused, the vertebrae are squared. This fracture is called as carrot stick fracture or chalk stick fracture, which is a fracture seen in fused vertebrae, especially Ankylosing spondylitis. This is the case of ankylosing spondylitis, uh, and uh, uh, even in OPLL or a dish, it can uh, chronic and in stage cases it can cause stiff, uh, fused vertebrae and such fractures can occur. So that is a characteristic fracture. Again, this is a uh, radiograph of the neck, but not for the cervical spine. In a child, usually taken. What is the abnormality you are identifying? Can you identify anything in a child? So this, yes? Yes, that is a large. The, you can see an opacity here, which is very smoothly indelling on the air column, nasopharyngeal air column, and uh, obstetric. That is why the, the, the child snows and uh, sleeps with an open mouth. That is the adenoidal hypertrophy. So, the so neck x rays can be uh, often asked in children. Uh, that is soft tissue neck x-ray to identify the that is lateral view. The other one are, are for the bones. Again, another case of a heterotopic ossification, like uh, abnormal uh, bone uh, density in the soft tissue. This was a case of a 20, 22 year old male uh, with a seizure disorder on multiple anti-epileptic drugs. <coughs> Uh, almost bedridden and uh, came with encephalopathy recently and uh, because of the pain in the hip and uh, elbow x-rays were done and see flowing uh, opacities like this dense calcified opacities they are heterotopic ossifications can be uh, unknown cause uh, or acquired also uh, the close dd is myositis ossificans that is abnormal ossification in the subcutaneous this is a marked as synovial chondromatosis mimic. Obviously, you can see some foreign body, I mean, uh, loose body like appearance in the left hip. This is not a chondromatosis, but this was a cement granuloma, bone cement granuloma with the infection. What happened was this uh, elderly male had undergone a left hip replacement. Within two months, he developed a joint infection of the implant and multiple discharging sinuses were there. Then he came to our um, uh, the, uh, uh, hospital and uh, uh, the infection was identified. Then he was under a IV injection as well as this was opened. The explantation was done, implant was removed. Antibiotic uh, pellets were also put in that joint. Wash, uh, thorough wash was done. And then uh, later all those antibiotic pellets were removed. And see, you can see abnormal gas lucencies because of the infection and the repeated procedures of the joint. And also the bone cement which was kept previously formed a uh, inflammation there forming a bone cement granuloma. Just to make you aware, such conditions are or can also exist in such history, like proper clinical history, there can be lesions like this, this mimic the synovial chondromatosis. 
This is a pelvis X-ray uh, showing a right hip prosthesis along with features in the bone, suggestive of Paget's disease that is coarsened the bony trabeculae and mixed loosened and uh, sclerotic area, suggesting a Paget's disease, prominent iliopectineal line. What is the close DD such a sclerotic holes, bones in elderly? Yes, meds from prostate. Yes, prostatic meds can be the close DD. Good. This is a child X-ray, uh, right hip pain with limbi. X-ray was done. Hip joints normal. What else can you see? Sort of. Yes, osteoidosteoma. A sclerotic area with the central lucency, the nidus. So the hip pain was a complaint. So include the uh, uh, for the hip and the pelvis, we include the upper femora also, and abnormality was here. This is another uh, pelvis X-ray to look for the uh, implant uh, on both hips. Any incidental finding you can see? There is a hernia, inguinal hernia, having some radiopaque uh, objects. I mean marker like marker like uh, opacity. So this can get be you can confuse it with uh, like in an LS spine X-ray also you may get this. So you just have to ask the patient about the history of any surgery, any mesh. Get a classical X-ray or hands of um, a rheumatoid arthritis patient where you can see that uh, there are uh, peri uh, articular osteoporosis. The carpal bones are all uh, very much, uh, what to say, uh, closely spaced with uh, multiple lucencies over it. And uh, all the interphalangeal joints are showing very articular osteoporosis, diagnosed case. And in advanced cases, there can be deformities. You can see there are some uh, deformities here, not uh, the classical ones, but uh, she is developing some deformities. Just to show some... Um, common x-rays. This is a 70 teenager who is diagnosed with a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, advanced uh, arthritic changes on the right knee with a loss of joint space including both the medial and lateral compartment. Here also there is loss of uh, reduced the joint space but here it is almost ankylosed. And there is severe osteoporosis also, periarticular osteoporosis, JRS. This is a trauma case. Uh, I am showing you two views uh, with pain, trauma and pain in the foot. This looks very normal. Can you see anything abnormal here? See the second metatarsal, there is a fracture. There is a thin line, thin recency with a slight, almost undisplayed. So you can miss this if you see only one view. That's why I showed you. So usually anterior lateral and oblique views are taken. So all the joints, all the musculoskeletal x-rays usually should uh, uh, be, uh, uh, should have two or three views to uh, identify the abnormality. So this is a hairline fracture. And sometimes uh, in case of trauma, immediately after trauma, you may not see the hairline fracture. After walking and after applying the fresh uh, load on the weight on those foot, this may get displaced and later x-ray will show if you missed in the first x-ray. The last slide, again a patient with a uh, foot pain, edema, ulcer, chronic ulcer and edema like cellulitis, clinically cellulitis wanted to rule out osteoporosis, osteomyelitis, x-ray was done. There is no feature of osteomyelitis here, bones are normal. You can see some uh, opacities here in the soft tissue. This is a finding which you usually get in chronic cellulitis. The subcutaneous tissue gets thickened and there can be some, the usual loosened appearance of the subcutaneous fat will be replaced and will be hyper like this. So this is a case of cellulitis, no osteomyelitis. And there can be vascular calcifications also. Thank you. Uh, these are some of the radiographs.